it's time for our reading of the scripture. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And then from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he appro approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices with all the miracles he, they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As they approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls. They will not leave this one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. The Lord be with you. Well, there is a park not too far from where I grew up in Pennsylvania called Ringing Rocks, where there's a big field of boulders. The field is seven acres, and the boulders reach 10 feet deep. When you go there, you take a hammer along, and you climb around the rocks, and you lightly hit the, the rocks, and they ring. I've really only been there a couple times that I remember, but I did a little internet research, and apparently the whole thing is shrouded in mystery. According to an article from the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, Native American stories passed through the generations to the first white settlers in the mid-1700s suggest that the field possesses an eerie aura. Animals were said to have steered clear of the rocks, and plant life was described as being completely absent from the surface. The seemingly cursed nature of the boulder field was only further supported by claims of the rock's ringing properties. Scientists wonder, where did the boulder field come from? It doesn't appear to have been made by a glacier, and it's, it formed on the top of a hill, not the bottom like you would expect from a landslide. And why do the rocks ring? The park is actually much larger than the boulder field with acres and acres of wooded trails and the largest waterfall in Bucks County. 
but the rocks in the surrounding woods don't ring. Furthermore, of the rocks in the boulder field, about one-third of them ring, while two-thirds don't. And just by looking at them, there's nothing to distinguish which ones will or won't ring. The ringers are called live, and the others dead. The article goes on to say, the true splendor of the boulders of ringing rocks did not emerge until the late 19th century when a Bucks County local, Dr. J.J. J. Ott, ventured to create music with the rock's acoustic qualities. After collecting specific rocks that possessed varying pitches, Dr. Ott arranged a concert in 1890 for the Buckwampum Historical Society of Bucks County. Accompanied by the Pleasant Valley Band, a brass ensemble, Dr. Ott performed various selections using the rocks. In an article entitled Rock Music for Natural History Magazine, John Gibbons and Stephen Schlossman portray Ott's performance as possibly the first ever rock concert. <laughs> According to Jesus, it wasn't the first rock concert, or at least the first potential rock concert. There are lots of places in the Bible where the creation is called on to give audible praise to God, or just does praise him by being what it is. So, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, Psalm 19. Or this one from Psalm 96, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound in all that is in it, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy, let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. Job 12 says, but ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And one of my very favorites is in Isaiah 55, verse 12. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into singing, and all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. So when Jesus said, if his disciples were quiet, the stones would cry out, maybe he was thinking of some of these verses and others like them, and maybe the stones would literally call out praise as Jesus came into Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Maybe they ring out, like the stones at Ringing Rocks Park. And they would be right to rejoice and be glad. God had promised through the prophets to come to his people to rescue them, to send a Messiah that would be God's own son, coming to rule them in peace. Israel had waited for centuries for the fulfillment of these promises. His disciples have become convinced that Jesus is that Messiah sent by God, which means Jesus riding the colt, a donkey, according to Matthew, into Jerusalem, is God coming to his people, just like Zechariah prophesied. The rocks don't have to cry out, because the disciples themselves put Jesus on the donkey, lay their cloaks on the road as a sign of their loyalty to their king, and shout praises for all his works. They recognize he's their king, and they're happy to welcome him into the city where God said he would reign. What's more, it's the time of the Passover, the great freedom festival of Israel, the time they celebrate the greatest rescue God ever performed, bringing them out of bondage in Egypt into their own land where they could worship him freely and in the way that he prescribed. Surely this was their anointed Messiah coming to rescue them from their enemies, and they would not be silenced. And even if they were, the creation would pick up the song and sing. But there is another way that rocks could cry out, and that is in witness to God. 
Israel was familiar with this because they set up stone markers all over the, the wilderness and the promised land. There were markers that reminded them of the covenant promises they'd made before God. And there were stones that reminded them of the amazing things God had done for them. Joshua declared that a stone he set up would be a witness against Israel if they didn't keep their promises to follow God. He didn't mean that the stone would give verbal testimony, of course. It was a sign, a marker, and it exposes the hardness of heart, disbelief, and disobedience of the people who saw it. It would prick their conscience every time they remembered why that stone had been raised. If Jesus had stones literally singing praise in mind, then even that would be a witness against the Pharisees who wanted the disciples to be quiet. Who's the stony one now? The inanimate rocks crying out praises to God? Or the hard-hearted Pharisees who couldn't see the truth of what was happening right before their eyes? If Jesus was talking about the silent witness of stones erected to remember God's covenant, he might have even been talking about the temple built of stones. The Mount of Olives, where this parade began, afforded pilgrims their first look at the temple on that long trek to Jerusalem. Planned by David and built by Solomon in the 900s BC, it was a beautiful and extravagant witness to the faithfulness of God. It was the place where he promised to dwell among the Israelites, where there would be forgiveness and fellowship through the regular sacrifices that were made there. Of course, that temple was ravaged by Israel's enemies, and the Hebrews were carried off into exile, and Ezekiel saw God's glory leave the temple, and then in another vision, come back. And when the Hebrews came back after 70 years of exile, they rebuilt the temple, but it was never the same. Smaller, with less splendor, the elders who had worshipped in the original wept when they saw the re renovation. Still, to the Jews coming to the Passover from far away, when they reached the top of the Mount of Olives and caught their first sight of the temple after a long pilgrimage, the sight would be a thrill. Those stones stood as a witness of God's faithfulness more than any other stone marker. Within those stones were cleansing, healing, and God's presence. But Jesus weeps over it because this is a momentous day. He is coming, God's representative, and they don't recognize him. They won't acknowledge him or follow him, and in just a few decades, he predicts the temple will be destroyed again. Not one stone will be left on another. You know the story. The Jews wanted relief from their enemy Rome, who occupied Israel, as well as a much larger area. They thought the way to freedom was violence and warfare, but Jesus, the Messiah's way, was different. He would not rise up against their enemy with an army or weapons, because he was fighting a different enemy. He was in a spiritual battle against Satan and all the demons and the sin and death they bring. And he would wage that battle in his body on the cross, the one true Passover sacrificial lamb that brought us freedom. But to the people, he came in peace. He was the king coming into his city not to declare war, but peace. Those who would follow him in peace would escape the destruction of the temple and its people, but those who insisted on violence would themselves be destroyed, and the smashed stones would lie as witnesses against their violence and disbelief. So there are stones that praise and stones that stand as witnesses. And I don't know if you noticed it or not, but we had another reading way back during the call to worship, which was from Psalm 118. And here we encounter another stone, the stone that the builders rejected, but has now become the cornerstone. A cornerstone is important. Usually at the top of an archway, the stone that brings all of the other stones in the building together and completes the building. Of course, this is Christ's place and function in the church. But first, 
he was rejected. The crazy thing about Palm Sunday is that with firm resolve, Jesus continued on into Jerusalem. Luke gives us lots of milestones to mark his progress. He approached Bethphage and Bethany, and he came to the Mount of Olives. They started down the road that goes down the same mountain. Day by day and step by step, Jesus is coming closer to the time and place of the fulfillment of God's promises to save the world. He knows his time has come. And as he has always obeyed his heavenly father, nothing, not even all of Satan's powers, would stop him now. Certainly not the rejection of the people, either Jews or Romans. He would be rejected because he was not what people had expected or would expect of someone worthy to be called king. They were blinded by their own tradition and expectation. This came not on a brilliantly decorated horse, but humbly on a donkey over roads strewn with peasants' clothes. He would not conquer Rome, commanding a great army, but he conquered the hearts of people with his compassion, mercy, and grace. And the peace he came to bring was not the temporal peace that Rome enjoyed for a while, but peace with God, a peace that lasts into eternity for those who believe in him. Although they grasped some of this, or some people did, overall their stubborn belief in a human warrior king kept them from seeing Jesus for who he truly was, God visiting his people, and they rejected him. But his determination to obey his father, his willingness to give his own life and sacrifice, Jesus became the cornerstone of the new temple, his body, the church. His followers would have a new understanding of the temple and where to find that place of sacrifice and forgiveness, cleansing, healing, and fellowship with God. Jesus himself would be that place, and they would be the stones, living stones, being built into the temple of Jesus Christ. Living stones, alive by the Holy Spirit dwelling within, loudly ringing out the praise of their God. Living stones, oriented to their cornerstone, being built one on the other, straight and square, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord by their word and deeds. The Pharisees and others in the crowd later that week, who cried, crucify him, had unmet expectations. That is, if Jesus were really the Messiah, he would act a certain way. We have expectations of God, too. If he's really a savior, he'll get me out of this mess or fix it. A disease, a bad marriage, unemployment, turbulent relationships, whatever. We expect him to answer every prayer, make things easy and comfortable. But Jesus didn't go the comfortable route, and his followers must follow him. Our way is the way of the cross the way of self-sacrifice, of suffering, of love. Don't let your unmet expectations keep you from recognizing when Jesus comes into your life. Keep your eyes open so when Jesus comes in ordinary life, yet in surprising, humble ways, you will recognize the King. This next week, Holy Week, gives us the opportunity to meditate on his last week on earth. We can ponder why the creator of the universe, the mighty, powerful, true God, would send his own heart, his only son, into the world to die on our behalf, taking on the punishment that we deserve so that we can attain what we don't deserve, eternal, abundant life with God. Things get obscured a little bit because we know that Jesus was a man of sorrows, and this week we see it up close as he weeps over Jerusalem, as he is mocked and whipped and stands silent before his accusers, as he sweats drops of blood in Gethsemane. But Jesus did it for joy. Joy. 
It was joy for him to obey God, and he knew his suffering would bring God joy. It brought him joy because he wants us. He's for us. And there was no way we could attain the holiness and righteousness we need without Jesus. And he did it for love. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the beginning, God made people for a reason, for love and fellowship. When we blew it with sin, he didn't just throw up his hands and give up. Love found a way to bring us back. You know those rocks at Ringing Rocks Park? As you can imagine, scientists have studied them and studied them to figure out why they ring. There are several theories having to do with the iron content of the rocks or the layering of them in the field, but no definitive answer has been agreed upon. I prefer to believe that, like people, although some of them are dead, some are alive to their creator, ready to ring out praise. As we ponder the love of God this week, remembering how Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, gave the Lord's Supper for the ongoing nourishment of our souls, prayed for, suffered, and died for us, may it all move us to the praise befitting followers of the true King. He's the King of our hearts and of our church. When we recognize him, we praise him. Or will you remain silent? and leave it for the stones to cry out. Amen.